uh, there we be. Uh, looks like Zoom has, uh, has continued to change their interface, so it's always interesting. Uh, and uh, we're always sort of mindful of some of the security issues. I think, uh, actually, Brian, did you see the email that I, I circulated through David uh, yesterday to that, to that point? Uh, I, I, sorry, I hadn't gotten to it. It was, oh. was a trickling. So, so we had uh, one of one of our members uh, was on a uh, I think they were on a meetup call uh, I think it was out of Europe if I, I recall and and uh, there was uh, some what, what's it called Zoom Zoom bombing yeah Zoom bombing yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. so I I, I, I talked to David about it forwarded yeah forwarded that along uh, so uh, so I think we're fairly secure here uh, as long as host keeps host and and we don't uh, let everyone be host I think we're generally okay but. Uh, yeah, there we go. I, I, I still see it enabled to uh, um, share my screen. I don't know if I have, I have some special privilege, but uh, I, what we're trying to do is turn off uh, screen sharing and annotation as a um, you know to 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 the general population, right? Um, uh, you know, hosts can still do it, and hosts can still grant that to to people. Um, but uh, you know, that's screen sharing and annotation is how Zoom, a lot of Zoom bombing happens. So yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so I, I have screen sharing turned off for participants, and uh, and I think the way that I had it set up was uh, that as long as host is sharing, no one else can sort of take oh, over. Yes. So okay, so that should be that should be sufficient. Uh, but uh, oh, good morning, Wendy. When, so Wendy was Wendy was a person that was kind enough to pass along the information. Oh yeah, you're so welcome. And um, what I'd like to do is when I find out about the next Hyperledger Africa meeting, I will pass it along to this group. Um, it would be wonderful to show them support after what they went through yesterday. Yeah, no, that's that's horrible. I'm sorry to hear that that happened and thank you for um, bringing that to our attention. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, let's get started. It is top of the hour. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, this is a Hyperledger Healthcare Special Interest Group. This is our first general meeting since, uh, oh boy, since March. So it's been quite a while. Uh, we're we're going to try to sort of get back into a more uh, typical cycle uh, for the special interest group, but we're going to continue to pay attention to the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus pandemic, and so we'll be talking about that a little bit later. We'll continue to sort of feature some of those uh, topics and issues uh, as they come along. Uh, in fact, just before the call, uh, I, uh, I saw an invite through LinkedIn that I think I'll pass along uh, to membership. Uh, I need to just sort of vet it to make sure I understand uh, who's offering it. But there are quite a number of folks that are out there continuing to, to talk uh, and work around the COVID virus. So this is certainly uh, not something that uh, that has gone away. In fact, just before the call, uh, a couple of us, uh, just before the hour, uh, were talking about some of the longer term implications of the virus uh, culturally. And, uh, and so this is gonna be with us for quite some time. Uh, as a reminder, this is a recorded event. Uh, and so please be mindful of that. Uh, we have an antitrust slide that we maintain. Uh, please review it uh, and review the URL that's presented there uh, against uh, regarding antitrust. Uh, in general, uh, it is uh, really speaks to, to being a good person and making sure that in any IP that you present here in a public forum is, is suspect. So please uh, be thoughtful to that extent. Um, and, uh, and let's see, like I said, we do have a, a, a very light crew. In fact, uh, every, oh, good morning, Jim. Uh, how are you? Good. I was just going to say, it looks like everybody on the call I, I know uh, pretty well. Yes. These are all of our, all, basically the regulars. Uh, good morning, Ravish. How are you? Oh, and Ravish, you're, yeah, there we go. Yeah, good morning. How are you doing? <laughs> good, good. How are you? I'm doing good. Great, great to have you on the call. Um, so, oh, and, and Kamlish just joined. Good morning, Kamlish. How are you? Yeah, good morning. Great to have you on the call. Yeah, good, good. So yeah, so it looks like we have a pretty small gr uh, group this time around. I don't see any new folks. Uh, I, I spoke with a couple of folks over the past couple of weeks who are uh, will be joining us presumably soon. If not on this call, we've got uh, quite a new, uh, new group of members, I think coming out of India. And then uh, there was a, a person that I uh, uh, reached out to me on the East Coast. So I suspect we'll be seeing them uh, maybe on today's call. Uh, if not today, then in the next cycle. 
Um, so everybody kind of understanding of uh, where we are with introductions. Uh, and so as well, uh, just as a reminder, I think most of us have done this already, uh, but we do have our membership uh, directory. So please make use of that to the extent that you feel it's, uh, it's valuable. Uh, we, get, we continue to get some good engagement with that. So it's always great to see. Um, and then I think let's segue over to uh, any community announcements uh, that anyone would like to, to bring up in the, in the forum here. All righty, sounds mighty quiet. Well, like I said, I do have a couple of potentials that are coming through. Like I said, I need to vet them. I think one of the sites uh, that had, had uh, made a request to me was an uh, uh, organization, uh, I think it's block.io um, or block.co, I'm sorry, I think that's what it was. Uh, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna look into that uh, just to see, but they look like they're doing some presentation uh, using blockchain technologies on COVID virus. I'll, I'll pass that along to membership uh, when, I, when I have a, better chance to, to talk with uh, the folks that are presenting that. Um, so let's see, so uh, we haven't done subgroup updates in quite some time. Uh, in fact, we're, we're coming up on our quarterly cycle uh, end of this, uh, end, of, end of this month, uh, we'll be in our sort of uh, mid-year review. Uh, I'll be reaching out to, the, to leads so that we can get status and roll-ups uh, as we've done. Uh, we used to do a quarterly, we're gonna do it uh, semi-yearly now. Uh, semi-annually, and so uh, I'll reach out to leads on that. Um, so uh, for patient subgroup, uh, uh, Dennis uh, and I just exchanged uh, an email uh, a little while ago. It is his birthday today, so he is actually on the lake, uh, or a lake. Uh, I'm not sure which lake. Uh, this is back in Switzerland. Um, he said he was going to try to call in on a mobile phone, so <laughs> I, that, boy, that's a that's commitment if he does. Um, so uh, he did let me know that the patient member subgroup continues to move forward. Uh, they, they have done their uh, POC e-consent work uh, and they're, what they're doing uh, right now is they're sort of reconvening to, to, to decide how, how to proceed beyond their POC. Uh, and it, just as a reminder, the POC that they've worked uh, is e-consent uh, in the pharma industry. Um, Dennis, uh, who, uh, who leads this, uh, has uh, an extensive background in the pharma space uh, back in Europe. And, uh, and the e-consent work that they've done, he's done a ph phenomenal job uh, engaging quite a number of, uh, of HC SIG members uh, at a global level, um, including, uh, oh gosh, uh, Kent Lau, I think, uh, who's uh, a pharmacist out of Hong Kong, if I recall, uh, was a, a major player in that work effort. Um, I don't see anyone or don't recognize anyone on the call who's also uh, a member of the subgroup. Just offhand, I could be wrong. Um, I've attended that subgroup. Um, I'm not there all the time, but I have attended it on a fairly regular basis. And you're right about Kent. He's actually got two different POCs he's working on right now, um, just testing out uh, for his application to see if um, how Fabric compares to Besu. So he's, he's actually in the middle of working on that. Oh, good. Yeah. And so, so what, uh, so what Dennis passed along to me is they're, they're going to be uh, reconvening and they do get together uh, every other week. Um, they're going to be uh, convening to decide how to sort of move forward from their POC. And the POC itself, um, evidently, uh, from Dennis's point of view, has gotten uh, a lot of very good attention uh, out of Europe. And so uh, I, I would imagine uh, they'll, they'll be able to sort of maybe turn that into something. Uh, and I don't know if he's looking for funding support or how he's going to move forward with it, but that's kind of the plan going forward. Um, anything else, Jim, that, that I may have yeah, missed? And this is, so here's my problem. I wish Kent was here because I'm going to say something that is probably 75% right, but could be 25% wrong. I believe the POC he's running is on Fabric 1.4 on the Fabric side. And the problem with that is I know enough on Fabric 2.0 to say many of the conclusions you would draw about Fabric from 1.4 would not be at all valid in the 2x environment for what it's worth. And this is June. Next month, the end of next month, they're supposed to be shipping 2.2 of Fabric in theory, uh, which is the long-term uh, stable release. The bigger thing is that the functionality, how the whole platform runs both operationally and from a, I'll call it a smart contract coding perspective, is significantly different. Um, you know, so it's it makes it difficult if you do a POC on one four, and then try to say, okay, here's here's what I come away with as conclusions, 
it's you know that's has some validity but probably not a lot in many cases yeah it's a it's a, it's a bit time box so i don't know brian do, do you have any insight into the re release schedule for for fabric offhand uh <clears throat> just that 2.2 is planned to be a long-term support release um uh, and uh it will be I, I don't know. I, I I I don't I don't know when it'll uh, be released, but it should oh, okay. be within the next month or two. Um, yeah. Because... Ap <laughs> Apologies for putting you on the spot. <laughs> so yeah. So that sounds really interesting, Jim. Uh, and yeah. And Kent usually is on the call, and so uh, I'll I'll work with Dennis to see if we can get some update uh, from Dennis on specifics to that. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, I do know that they are working to sort of uh, sort of decide how, how to move forward after the POC. And, and it was a very successful POC. Uh, there were quite a number of folks uh, that, that have been involved at, at different levels. Uh, uh, there's a gentleman out of, uh, I want to say Russia, Alex, I think uh, is sort of the short, I think it's Alexander. And uh, Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he also did the Sawtooth uh, uh, healthcare um, Hyperledger lab work. Um, and so um, uh, he's a factor involved in that as well. Uh, and actually to that point, uh, I was just exchanging some, uh, some, uh, some talk with um, uh, Vipin, who's uh, one of the leads for uh, one of our other work, work groups, uh, not SIGs. And so Vipin, I think we're gonna see uh, helping to sponsor uh, another healthcare project in, uh, in Hyperledger labs. And so that's great. Uh, and, and as a reminder, um, there's a little bit of confusion around this uh, that comes up. So uh, special interest group uh, uh, chairs aren't, aren't, aren't permitted to, to sponsor, so it has to sort of get routed through work groups instead. So uh, Vipin is, uh, has been kind enough to sort of uh, work as a proxy for, for a lot of this uh, work effort. And, uh, and Ravish as well, um, uh, you guys just had a, 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 your, I think you did a pharmacy uh, um, project yeah. through Hyperledger Lab too. Yeah, it was uh, modernizing pharmacy management, you know, for, I mean, there are various use cases and we are just kicking that off. We, we got the lab approved. So it's in the, in the GitHub now. So we, we are, we are just starting it and we were just finalizing about the fabric 2.0 and, and, you know, as Jim mentioned, 2.2 is, is around the corner. So, you know, luckily, I mean, we are just starting right now. So we should be able to, you know, get to a new version um, with what we are doing. Okay. Well, yeah. Well, I, well. Congratulations on that. That that took a little bit took a little bit of time uh, to make that happen. But I'm glad to see that that's that's transpired. Uh, let, let's segue over to you, Ravish, and let's talk about the pair subgroup. Sure. Sure. So, um, in pair subgroup, uh, we are looking at um, you know first use case that that came up was the pharmacy management. There is a lot of spend. I mean, if you all know from you know one of the healthcare. Um, payer's biggest cost is specialty medication and pharmacy and with all these opioids and you know all these things happening around um, we are looking at a use case wherein we are um, you know kind of leveraging blockchain to to create a, a, a much better um, real-time consent from member so that the you know the duplication of the uh, uh, fulfillment and and fraud and you know so-called ghost prescriptions are not you know, coming into the system, um, we uh, we I, which I requested you earlier. Maybe we can put it on the list for the next week, uh, next meeting. I would love to go through that use case in in this forum and get some feedback to refine that use case. I think we are seeing a lot of traction, and uh, the use case caters to both the you know um, scenarios of fraud and better management, real time consent from member, and all, but also enables you know um, fraud management and uh, ease of fulfillment. You know, uh, there are cert certain industries in, uh, from payer standpoint, which is vision industry, deals with prescription a little bit differently, wherein I want to be able to go to a, a fulfillment shop and get my prescription. But if I don't like there, I want to go to another one. Today, you, if, if I'm sure those who wear glasses in the US, you know, go through that pain of, I didn't like it here. If I have to go to another one, I have to get the auth released. And you know they have to send the fax the prescription um, to 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 the next fulfiller and and things like that. So there is this ease of use and and you know while enabling the fraud management. That's the use case that we are focusing on, and would love to cover that. I mean we are we are seeing um, interest from additional you know team members joining. So I think we are, we are so far we are so far so good. 
Yeah, yeah, that, and that's a good re reminder, uh, Ravish. Uh, I have a note here that, uh, yeah, we could uh, set aside some time for a presentation from the payer subgroup. That would be great. Yep. Perfect. Uh, and uh, just and as a reminder, you want to uh, talk a little bit about your the schedule for your meetings. Yes. So we meet every other uh, Friday, not this Friday, but the next Friday, um, and every other Friday. Uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have been talking, uh, I know Kent is also an active uh, you know, member of our group and we are talking about if there is a change in schedule required or not. So far, uh, we are doing good, but in case it changes, I will definitely inform and put it on our uh, wiki. But all the meeting notes and everything is available on the wiki as well. You know, just like we are following the protocol for all each of the meetings. Excellent. Yeah. And, and yeah. And so the, the easy, the easy way that I think about it is it's, it's opposite this meeting uh, at 10 o'clock uh, Pacific or uh, to your point, one o'clock Eastern. Uh, and so, and you, and you guys meet uh, pretty regularly uh, and uh, yeah. And so, yeah, I have a note here. I'll follow up with your revision. We'll, we'll get some time scheduled so you guys can uh, present uh, uh, much like we did with the patient subgroup. Uh, gosh, it's been maybe so several months ago, I guess, earlier this year before the COVID stuff. So yeah, over thank you. Over. <laughs> yeah, uh, th yeah, I had to think about it. Boy, it's been a while. <laughs> oh, good grief. Thanks, Ravish. Uh, so, uh, so I'll speak uh, on behalf of uh, Stephen Elliott. Uh, uh, Stephen uh, has been out for, uh, for a while uh, due to some uh, health issues. Uh, the healthcare interoperability subgroup uh, uh, does meet uh, twice. Oh, uh, we're getting some feedback. For, just hold on just a sec. I'm on mute here. Um, uh, so the, uh, the healthcare uh, interop subgroup meets uh, every other Monday. Uh, I want to say 8 o'clock Pacific time. I'd have to double check that. Uh, but Stephen's been driving this. This is our newest subgroup. And the focus uh, is really on interoperability. And, and he's developing uh, really a stack. Uh, on top of uh, a DLT, ideally it's fabric, could be sawtooth, uh, and the intent of that is for the sake of interoperability. And, and the, the, the key takeaway from this is the focus tends to be more uh, semantic interoperability and less syntactic interoperability, and so that's where their work effort goes to. Uh, they're, they're still developing uh, a sort of a core team there and that subgroup, so if there's anyone interested that wants to be uh, participating in that, uh, feel free to do so. Um, yeah, I, Rich, yeah, I participated yeah. in that, yeah, I I was gonna, that yeah. group, and yeah. I will say that, yeah, he has selected Fabric as his POC platform, so he's moving ahead with that, and you're right, it's absolutely focused on data interoperability, semantic interoperability, as opposed to technical between two different blockchains, for sure. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so, uh, so again, I, uh, Stephen and I talked. Uh, so uh, there, he's had had a bit of a challenge, uh, sort of maintaining consistency there. But it's a really, it's an it's an amazing subgroup. Uh, Stephen is a super bright guy, and so if anyone uh, wants to sort of uh, get on that uh, on that subgroup uh, and uh, to sort of help uh, to continue to drive that, again, we're building a core team around that right now, and so uh, looking forward to that. Okay, um, any other comments as far as subgroups go? Uh, and, and again, uh, Ravish, uh, I, yeah, it's, uh, I will plan to have some time uh, set aside so that we can get the uh, pair subgroup together. Sure. All right. Oh, oh uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I have, I, I'm getting some feedback from someone, uh, Nurkens. Hi, Rich. This is Dennis speaking. Oh, Dennis, <laughs> how are you? Happy, happy <laughs> I, I, birthday I'm to sorry. You. <laughs> Thank you very much. I am just on the uh, Geneva Lake on the boat. Oh, okay. and I tried to connect it and I succeeded at the end. Oh, well, well, well first of all, great, great to have you on the call and happy birthday. And Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I got uh, a surprise in the last minute and uh, I had to take it. Well, good. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So the the boat being on the boat is a surprise. I'm assuming. I don't want to know more. If there's no, it's, more it's to it, it's a nice one. It is almost 110 years old. Can oh, very, imagine? very cool. Well, I I, I did <laughs> uh, I did do uh, your your uh, patient subgroup update. But do you wanna you wanna talk a little bit more about some of the work that you guys have been doing? Yes, uh, we are reorganizing our group after our uh, POC of e consent. And uh, you might already uh, made an update. I don't uh, talk too much. Uh, 
everybody from uh, from the list call is very much also welcome to join our uh, subgroup because uh, uh oh uh, we can uh, define another use case altogether also uh, relevant to the corona days covid 19 days and patient data together with the standards is very much relevant and i just also had yesterday an interesting call uh, with one of the big pharma in switzerland one of the topics they are very, very much uh, interested are is fair data i also send an email to you rich yes yes i saw and any any person any uh, interested parties are very much welcome to our group and this is every second week on Monday before Stephen's meeting, uh, seven, this is seven uh, in the morning, Pacific time. And uh, I'm looking forward to our cooperation. Oh, excellent. So, uh, so, so, I'm, so Dennis, just to confirm, I'm, I'm able to forward that along to membership, that invitation? I beg your pardon, I couldn't catch you. Oh, I'm sorry. So, so what you forwarded over to me regarding that, is that an open invitation to all HCSIG members? Exactly, very much so. Oh, perfect. Thank you okay. very much. Uh, yeah, absolutely, I will do so. Thank you. Um, well, thanks for that, uh, Dennis. Uh, have a great birthday. Uh, Thank you very much. And, and stay safe. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Have a great weekend, guys. All right. Take care. Thank you, Dennis. Bye bye. <laughs> wow, that was timing. <laughs> timing for that. Uh, okay, so uh, so that's our our subgroups update. So let's move into our ad hoc teams. Uh, so I have an, uh, generally speaking, I have an open sort of uh, call to anyone that is uh, a confluence expert. Uh, and we're always looking for ways to, to sort of rethink and re, uh, put redesign to, uh, to, this, uh, to this wiki, uh, as well as extend that, uh, obviously, to any, any other uh, special interest groups that we have through the Confluence uh, domain space here in, in Hyperledger. Um, uh, I, I'm always just interested in, in getting a better sense for how we want to structure things, and so that's uh, always available to anyone that's interested. Uh, as well, our HC uh, SIG uh, use case development team, led by uh, our, our vice chair, Erica Bierbauer, uh, continues uh, to, to work on use case development as they relate to uh, blockchain uh, technologies. Uh, the, the, the premise behind this use case team is to develop a, a set of consistent use cases that define some of the, the various features uh, and, uh, and functionality around a specific blockchain technology uh, 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 availabilities or functionalities that are unique to blockchain. Uh, and this really came out of uh, one of the HIMSS meetings that I, I participated in, I guess it's now been a couple of years, and quite a number of folks had asked uh, if, uh, if we provided use cases so they, have a so they, had, they had a better opportunity to understand where the, the real value in blockchain technologies uh, uh, lie. And so, so the idea for this is to develop sort of a library of, uh, of consistent use cases that we could use to distribute uh, and obviously post here, uh, but get the message out about where the sort of sweet spot uh, of, of uh, blockchain technologies happen to be. Uh, as it relates to DLTs um, and uh, you know digital uh, credentialing um, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, currency, uh, 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 I'm losing my mind here. Um, and, and currency or tokens. Um, so uh, so that's kind of the idea behind it. Uh, and this has been something that actually Wendy, uh, you set up. Oh gosh, uh, probably about six months, maybe a year ago or so. Did yeah, you want to about talk, a year ago. Yeah, did you want to talk a little bit about it? This is something that you and I put together. Uh, Absolutely, um, sure. So some additional considerations are that. Um, remember how Judith Faulkner talks about Epic um, and how she describes Epic. She says that she sells Epic to the business office. And in using that mindset, it's really important to write these use cases so that a broader audience can understand and that the business office could see the value proposition behind the use case. So um, while we tend to focus on some of the technical issues, um, it's really important to make sure that it's written broadly uh, for a broader audience that can really understand and appreciate. 
And another consideration is that it's important for there to be appropriate attribution to source information. So when we first designed this use case group, we recognized that there is a developing body of academic literature that can provide support for many of the conclusions that we are making. And because this is a healthcare special interest group, um, remember that healthcare organizations like academic medical centers tend to focus on empirical evidence. And while empirical evidence is still growing, there is, again, a body of literature developing. And in order to be credible to these academic sources, we really need to cite academic literature for some of the claims, and it will be much better received. So the goal was to design a document that was three to five pages. I think we decided that the sweet spot was like four to five pages. So it was short enough to digest and um, really impactful about the value and credibility. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and that's, that's, that's a great sort of way to summarize it, Wendy. Uh, the idea is this needs to be communicated elegant, eloquently, very succinctly, very crisply. Uh, in a way that uh, really puts it puts emphasis on uh, you know the value add of, of blockchain technology specifically. So uh, yes, and, and now that I work for a blockchain company, I have learned <laughs> that we need to tailor the message to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> so <That's good. laughs> this this is great. Yeah, this I, is... Go 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 ahead, Ravish. Yeah yeah, go ahead. Rich, I, I just wanted to, um, you know, kind of echo what Wendy was talking about. And that's that's one reason why, you know, one of the things that we are also doing is to showcase that, um, you know, leveraging some of these low code platforms, integrating with the blockchain and giving the business user the power to think through in terms of use cases, because what is happening is, um, you know, when you talk about blockchain, you, you know, your business tends to more think, of developers, then they have the ability to think through this problem also, and not just bury themselves down into the technology, you know, but at, even at a business level, and the ability that we can create in the community for them to try out certain things themselves will actually help with the adoption. And, and that's something that I'm, I'm focused on as well. Um, to provide this ability to, you know, leverage some of these platforms and integrate with fabric, or sawtooth and, and showcase, you know, if I have to do a prototype, I don't need to really spend a lot of time getting all these developers. Can I, at a business level, can I show a prototype very quickly? I, I think those things are very important for business to think because they themselves don't, even if we explain it to them, they will still don't know what business problem they should solve. That mapping of that business problem and the blockchain capability, that gap, is what has to be filled and they that can be filled by virtue of you know trials and prototypes and whatnot that will help them clarify their business model and and business pro use case i mean that's hey, just my two cents that's so awesome and i'll add one more thing um as i work with clients we talk to them about how to calculate their return on investment and for some of the established clients that we have um, we are able to describe their return on investment to other future clients, and it's a really powerful and impactful message as part of the use case. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point, Wendy, and thanks for that. Thanks also, Ravish. Uh, yeah, I, and, and it really does go to the business case, and so, uh, and I think to Wendy's point, it's been very interesting over the uh, past few years, uh, I, I, certainly in the healthcare space, uh, and I think we've talked about this before at, at a much broader level, uh, because healthcare is so closely wedded to academia, there there is sort of an expectation of how new technology gets integrated into sort of the the, the mindset uh, of the industry, and so it is a much more um, uh, what's a good way more much more formal approach that we need to be sensitive to because uh, that's the expectation. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Jonathan, uh, you work in the healthcare world. I believe you're a physician. Is is this? Yep, and I've been good, in academia, so I was on faculty at Stanford, and then yeah, before yeah. I left to uh, two startup companies. Yeah, so so f feel free to sort of uh, weigh in on this point, uh, and and you know the, the sort of the takeaway that uh, that Wendy uh, provided. Yeah, I mean certainly. Um, so in academia, especially in medical informatics, I'm also a, so I'm a geneticist as well as being uh, board certified in medical informa informatics. 
And so, yeah, so definitely, I think there is a, a the academic um, necessity, I guess, for n research discovery. And I think that's always intrinsic in the healthcare delivery model, I think. And certainly when I was at Vanderbilt, it's even actually baked into the consent process. I was on the bioethics um, IRB board, and we actually at Vanderbilt actually, uh, when you sign the consent to treat, the first paragraph actually describes um, acknowledging that you are get, uh, participating in research. This is a research organization and the data derived from your care will be used for knowledge discovery. And this is really this concept of a learning healthcare system where we learn from every single patient who we uh, treat and that goes into a larger pool. I think the challenge is, is ultimately in, in healthcare is how do you facilitate knowledge discovery and dissemination of new knowledge with this idea of competition in healthcare? Because healthcare systems, and, and also like I, I've actually, uh, so Judy Faulkner actually came to uh, Vanderbilt when Vanderbilt decided to go with Epic and uh, there was this whole discussion about data blocking. And so I think it's, and I think her point was that um, uh, Epic's and, and Cerner's of the world aren't where the data blocking happens. Data blocking happens at competitive healthcare organizations that don't want you to go to their competitor down the street. And so I think it's really the sense of how can we have our cake and eat it too? How can we have knowledge discovery and disseminate that knowledge discovery among academic institutions and yet be competitive? And that's, I think, the challenge. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good insight. Uh, and and uh, so I do, uh, I, I'm currently doing some work with Providence Health, which is here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and uh, from a provider's point of view, uh, the, the data, that data backend uh, is, is absolutely valued. In fact, it's, it's interesting, uh, and I'll just talk sort of uh, separate from Providence, uh, that my observation between uh, the provider payer industry is it's always a it's sort of a, a tug of war <laughs> in terms of who, who wants access to the data and, and to what extent. Uh, and I'll just, I'll speak at a, again at a very general level. Payers always look to, to find ways to gather more data uh, that they, they can on, on the patient population. Uh, providers are very, uh, in some ways, resistant to that. And again, to your point, Jonathan, it seems to be the case that the, the emphasis right now is on the value of that data uh, and it's sequestered as a result. It's treasured, uh, maybe is a better way to put it. Uh, and maybe that needs to change going forward so that we can think more in terms of uh, the sharing of the inf information. Uh, my, my focus is on interoperability. And so uh, there are certainly technologies that enable that, uh, but it's in sort of an ongoing issue of discovery. Uh, in fact, I was on a call yesterday with uh, uh, what, what we call here in the US, uh, the Blues, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, organizations. And, uh, and the really discussion uh, continues to circulate around how do we share information uh, in a secure way and in a way that uh, all parties feel as if they have some level of engagement and still are able to protect information that to them is IP. Not, but it's interesting because it mirrors actually this idea of the Linux Foundation. So actually like, where you do actually have a lot of contributors, um, either people writing code for open source software, but yet the, the some of the end users are competitors. And so there really is a very similar model of, of of, of how the Linux Foundation is, is organized, where we have collaborators come together for the greater good, for the ecosystem, and yet we all can compete in our own niche. And so there's a, a very interesting balance in ecosystem there. Oh yeah, that, that's, a great, that's a great model, Jonathan. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think, uh, and again, this, this, this is maybe just a sort of history of the organization of, of the industry of healthcare. Uh, it, I think there's, it seems to be that there's more of that sort of discovery happening now where the notion of community sharing, uh, community best practices is, is just seems to be getting uh, sort of started. Maybe, you know, maybe it's getting emulated uh, by virtue of the fact that we have, you know, an open source uh, model that's out there that it seems to work just fine. And, and yeah, and so to your point, that, that may be a, a, a certainly a valid observation. Um, so... Uh, so thanks for that discussion. I think we did uh, we did Erica a, a great service on on talking around this. Thanks Wendy for adding your your sort of history on uh, the use case team. Uh, so that is uh, that is ongoing work that Erica is driving forward on. 
uh, they're meeting ad hoc at the moment. Um, and uh, I do know she's working with a couple of folks right now on some active use cases. Uh, but if you, if you do have interest, uh, feel free to contact myself or Erica and, uh, and, and get yourself involved in that. Uh, we'll probably be extending uh, uh, open invitations to membership um, uh, sort of moving forward as, as that team builds up because it looks like they're going to need some more help going forward. So, um, so anyway, uh, great conversation. Thanks for that. I appreciate it. Uh, anything else uh, before I move forward? Alrighty, uh, and good good morning, Guillermo. Uh, how are you? Hello, hi, Rich. How are you? Sorry, good. I just almost missed this call. Oh, good good to have you on the call. Uh, how's everything in Mexico? Uh, oh, it's pretty good. It's uh, getting traction. We are going to uh, present the Latin American uh, uh, regional uh, uh, cluster in next uh, Wednesday and in Mexico we are moving forward with the meetups. Thank you very much for asking. Oh good, glad, glad to hear that. Uh, so for those, uh, you pr I think everybody on the call probably knows uh, Guillermo uh, uh, presented early on in, in, during uh, our special topic meetings and so uh, thanks Guillermo for that and, uh, and we keep in touch and so uh, best of luck uh, going forward with meetups as well. Okay, uh, so let's get to uh, some unfinished business. Uh, we were just talking about the COVID virus. Uh, and in fact, that uh, really obviously con continues to be an issue. Uh, so I didn't want to overlook that entirely. Uh, first of all, a thank you to everyone, including Guillermo, uh, 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 who we were just speaking with, uh, for his partic participation over the past few months. As I said earlier, uh, I think it's, we started this in, uh, in March. Uh, and we just finished up, I think we had uh, seven or eight different sessions that we had set aside uh, that focused specifically on the topic of the COVID-19 virus pandemic. Uh, some, some really amazing work happened, I think, uh, as well. We got some excellent, uh, very, very unique insight. In fact, I share this information regularly uh, with people that I speak with uh, in the healthcare industry uh, as it relates to perspectives that we learned as, as a team here uh, at a global level about how the virus uh, has been managed. Uh, it's interesting, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm imagining, I think it was a comment that uh, Dennis made early, early on as well, uh, that relates to how different countries, uh, and, and in many ways those countries represent cultures, uh, have, have really treated the, the, the pandemic differently, and as a result, uh, aspects of that uh, virus have uh, really influenced those countries very differently. In, in many ways, and so we're always uh, sensitive to that uh, as uh, developers of solutions, uh, that one, one size uh, doesn't necessarily fit all. And so thanks everyone for, for your help, for your insight on that. Uh, I, I have gotten quite a number of uh, thank yous uh, regarding that, uh, the value to that. So thanks everyone, it really goes to, to your, uh, your work uh, and continue effort in solving some of these bigger issues. Um, and so uh, again, um, we, we certainly don't overlook that going forward, um, and and thank you. Uh, it's really been a great experience. Um, so uh, to that extent, uh, I'm going to continue to have sort of a set aside here in our general meetings. Uh, we may be going back to special topic meetings if if we have uh, uh, events that will drive that. Uh, but I wanted to sort of bring up again some of the some of the some, some funding support that we continue to monitor. Uh, from around the world and uh, for anyone that, that can take advantage of, of these funding opportunities, it'd be great to do so. Um, I'm not going to walk these necessarily one by one, but I did want to call out a couple of things. Uh, and I do update this stuff regularly and you'll see some where the updates go. Uh, typically the updates are either to the site, which means that something has happened recently on the site, and so I'll note that. Uh, some of the updates on some of these sites uh, really kind of ended at one point and there really hasn't been any additional information. The information is still, according to that site, relevant. So even though you may see something that suggests that something happened well, while I'm looking at the NCI, for example, update was on March 27. Uh, there really hasn't been any news on that site uh, regarding that, but th those opportunities still exist. Uh, and for that specific call, uh, specific call out, uh, these are SBIRs, STTRs, uh, uh, really more for small businesses and small businesses to work with, acad uh, with academic institutions. And this is within the US. Um, for funding around the, uh, around the world, we do have grant opportunities in that section. And then I call out Canada because uh, we had a Canadian uh, member that wanted to get that information posted as well. 
Uh, I did want to call out specifically two things through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, I, I participated in some of these events in the past. Uh, it's a great organization to get involved in. Uh, and the deadline happens to be <laughs> today, uh, later tonight. Uh, so nine o'clock uh, Pacific time, well actually uh, one minute before nine o'clock Pacific time. Uh, and so I want to just call these out very quickly. Uh, you, you can sort of infer uh, that they aren't COVID specific, but you can kind of guess that they're really all about COVID. And so, uh, so we got two separate events here. They're somewhat similar and related, uh, and I believe uh, they are open to everyone, uh, and they are global, and so you may want to uh, take, a, take a look at that. Um, uh, but uh, the flag for that is that uh, the deadline is uh, uh, end of day today. Um, so, and then, like I said, the rest of these uh, we can walk through. Um, I, the other call out I guess I would make is UC Davis Office of Research uh, continues to do a great job of summarizing uh, at a high level uh, uh, for resource uh, for funding uh, at a much broader level uh, across multiple organizations. Okay, any, any discussion around COVID? Has anyone uh, been doing any work uh, with the COVID virus? Uh, solutions, uh, development, anything to that order that, uh, that you'd like to bring up? Jonathan, you should talk about your hackathon. Um, I did actually, I think uh, last, the last call two weeks ago, we actually had a very successful uh, hackathon, uh, Stop COVID-19, uh, sponsored by um, uh, Consensus uh, Health. And we also had um, uh, Hyperledger, uh, and, and we actually had our esteemed uh, colleague, Brian Bellendorf, as being one of the judges, as well as Vitalik Buterin, um, Joe Lubin, uh, myself, Debbie Bucci. Uh, we had some uh, phenomenal su submissions. We had uh, over 500 participants, um, 50 to 100 uh, mentors uh, who, who helped out uh, the use cases. Uh, in the end, we had, I believe it was uh, 30 or so um, submissions. Uh, five to six of those went to the final round uh, and we had three great submissions. Uh, the winning team was uh, called D-Plasma, which talked about convalescence plasma, uh, so donation of plasma to, fo to, uh, to, you know, to fight COVID-19, aka like from the movie Contagion was actually like it's sort of like the, the driving <laughs> case. Uh, we had some interesting um, immunity credentials uh, submissions, although I think, I'm not sure if that actually made it to the final uh, three. Um, you know, the, the, the challenge is I'm heavily involved in the immunity credentials is this idea of immunity passport. And that's the use case we've been driving in the IEEE uh, healthcare identity working group that I'm involved in. And I think the, what I struggle with is that it's not like this binary yes or no that you're actually immune either by exposure or by vaccination. It really is a system that how do you use that credential to, for us to learn the efficacy of the immunization or vaccine or how effective or efficient is this vac vaccine or your antibody test over time. So again, it goes into this idea of the learning healthcare model is actually, it's not binary. Yes, I can go out of my house and leave and, and go out and live my life and go to restaurants. It really is like, how do we actually have a reporting mechanism? So actually we as a society can learn from that data. But that, I think the hackathon, um, and I think a few of you on the call, including Brian, know that I've actually participated in or ran about five or six hackathons now. And I think it's a, a really great outlet, a mechanism for really a mindset of approaching this, that I'm not going to be an idle bystander um, without any skills. I'm going to use my skills to change the world. Excellent. Well, good. Uh, thanks for that, Jonathan. And uh, great to hear that you had that that man, many uh, number uh, that, that number of folks involved. So fantastic, uh, and and great to hear that. Uh, is there any any sort of follow up or traceability to this? Is there? Uh, do you guys uh, sort of uh, put? Um, I don't know. I'm trying to think of emphasis or spotlights on on those the winners. And is there a way we can sort of learn more about where, what the what the winning te teams are doing or how to sort of track their success? Yeah, we've been engaging those teams. In fact, I think we have ongoing discussions with them um, on this coming Monday, but it, it, there will be, I think, hopefully a recorded session um, when they represent on uh, next week on, on Thursday the 18th. I'm not sure if that's gonna be public or and or recorded, um, but I will let you know on our next call, um, ideally actually if, what the, the follow-up would be. Um, I think certainly it's, you know, some of these is really trying to figure out is there legs for commercialization and uh, like how can, uh, they, they can actually take their, their solution and run with it. I think, um, you know, the, some of the teams are actually already doing this. Uh, the, I think the second runner up actually was then 
uh, 3D printing of uh, PPE and face masks, um, and they're from Greece, and they're already engaged in the community with um, moving this with a solution to commercialization. So I, I think that's really uh, exciting, because actually it's really where the rubber meets the road. Actually, they're not staying idle, they're using their technology to um, help in this crisis. And I think the, the third team was a decentralized pandemic reserve, and there was really about how do we create smart contracts to incentivize the, the creating of a res reserve of PPE, and how do we actually form hospital co um, um, co collaborations to actually to um, create contracts for supply chain management. And you, this mirrors what actually what happened in different states. The states actually had to compete. Yeah, PPE. yeah. So how do we actually create contracts to actually, so we're all in it together and we actually can, you know, uh, let's say I have 20 ventilators but, and, and you need uh, some ventilators. How do we put those into a, a contract and, and ne negotiate uh, the supply chain of, and the reservation of those, those when, so we can scale up when we need them. Oh, excellent. So if, if you think it's appropriate, Jonathan, it'd be great if we might be able to have uh, some of those folks come and speak here uh, in this forum. Uh, with HC SIG membership, that that if if possible, that would be great if we could do that. Yeah, sure. Actually, I'm talking to them on Monday, so I'll I'll see if that's possible. Yeah, Excellent. the blood plasma uh, team <clears throat> uh, trying to you know match donors to to receivers uh, uh, for uh, antibody laden blood. Um, uh, I think in particular would be one uh, worth talking about here. Um, I think one thing they're trying to wrestle with a bit is the public versus private uh, uh, blockchain, as uh, you know, which is would be would be a better fit to, for what they do. Um, but I think they're probably closer than the other two in actually operationalizing um, what they've built. Uh, um, and maybe not though. I haven't followed up with the other two, but I, I did talk with Juliana uh, Dos Passos, who is the, um, the the one of the leaders behind the the, the Blood Plasma project, and I think it'd be um, an interesting topic for us here. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, Jonathan, if 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 you can maybe do a little due diligence and see if it's if it's possible, uh, if it's legal, anything to that extent, it'd be great. Yeah, sure thing. Yeah, it'd be great if we can find a way to 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 get that in front of membership. I think that would be great. Thank you. Definitely. And I and I think you know as I mentioned before on on the calls and to Brian was that really it's it's a sense of interoperability. You know, it's uh, you certainly we focused on the Ethereum. Um, blockchain, because that's what the company that I work for uh, is involved in. But you know, it's right. not about excluding this. It's and it's certainly it's about the ecosystem and how can actually we can interoperate with all existing and truly this idea of a hyper ledger uh, approach. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And 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 Brian, you'll have to cover your ears, but I think generally speaking, uh, membership here uh, for HC Sig still tends to be fairly platform agnostic. I think we're we're mostly in uh, still in a sort of education mode. Uh, whenever we do our uh, our surveys, uh, we 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 sort of uh, get a kind of a sense for where the where the sensitivity goes on that, and and still uh, we really uh, don't have uh, really uh, divisions, real strong divisions. It really is a more of a community approach to making use of the technology suite to the extent that they can, uh, and uh, and really the distinction uh, is is really at a very very high level. I think Brian, to your point, uh, pri private versus public. Uh, and in healthcare, um, I think the tendency goes to private, but platforms, I think generally, most, most folks, I think generally are still somewhat platform agnostic and it's really about education and learning. And no covering of ears needed here. We I certainly support that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and I okay. should also mention that we actually like the hyperletter Bezu is actually contributed by consensus and that's the uh, Ethereum. Oh yeah, um, excellent point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I certainly. Absolutely, uh, very, very good point. And I have one more question for Jonathan. <clears throat> Jonathan, if he's comfortable with that, just playing off. He, he, you had mentioned you're um, staying pretty close to some of the, the credentialing uh, work related to COVID credentialing and such. Um, there's the COVID creds initiative. And I think I saw somebody mentioned another um, kind of uh, proto standards kind of governance um, thing starting up as well. What, what is the right place for people to apply their, their time or their interest um, in, this, in this space? Uh, uh, to, to be helpful on this front or to, to see where the, the um, directions are heading. Yeah, I think I, I'm struggling with the COVID creds initiative. Um, I, I certainly, I signed up for the email and suddenly there was a press release that Consensus Health is a contributor. And so I was a little bit taken back by that because I don't understand the IPR protection of this pseudo like initiative of the COVID yeah. credentials. And I think it's, 
Um, I'm certainly much more comfortable in the space of the W3C working groups as they did in the verifiable credentials uh, working groups, uh, and then the uh, certainly Hyperledger with uh, Project Ares and, uh, and Ursa, where we're actually working out some of the cryptographic ver um, uh, interoperability. But really, at the, at the end of the get day, it's really about the semantic interoperability that I struggle with, which is that um, how can someone in, let's say, you know, uh, Berlin, uh, Germany, get vaccinated, fly to the U.S. and present that credential to the, at the border and verify the governance and the trust model that that physician is credentialed and has the authority to actually issue that credential. And how do we do that across languages? So the overlay capture network, which is what Paul knows um, uh, is presented, you know, he's from the um, Human Colossal Foundation and, uh, and they've presented. But there's uh, some IP issues that I have reservations about, about that approach. And I think I'm much more comfortable bringing those under uh, a project under like, I'd say Hyperledger, uh, Ares and or the W3. See, it's certainly, I, you know, it's, these things take time. And I think I'm, I'm concerned about this rush to ram these standards through the development process that we don't have it sufficiently vetted um, or that we've, it's, it's, it's haphazard. And they don't really solve the real problem we're trying to solve. And I think it, you know, it's it's rushing that standard and where that's it's piecemeal, and then it in the end it falls apart because we didn't give enough due diligence to either the cryptographic interoperability or the semantic interoperability, or we've actually allowed a submarine baton to infiltrate the process. Yeah. No. Uh, uh, okay. And then, are there any other efforts than the CCI? Um, worth tracking any other kind of standards conversations about this at w3c or, or elsewhere yeah so we're at consensus health we're involved in the in the uh, m covid so this is a uh, mitre corporation um and uh, mayo clinic and so we meet once a week um, with mostly about the data sets that are coming out of out of this and actually how do we share the data sets to actually do federated analytics and to learn from this there aren't very many really blockchain solutions to this um, certainly as we're involved we actually are trying to change that uh, that's uh, certainly you know Mayo Clinic on uh, John Helkema is used to be at the at Harvard the CIO of, of Harvard and has uh, deep expertise in in medical informatics approaches to the data analytics um, you know, certainly there's ample opportunity for this to be helped to be automated with blockchain uh, solutions and yet that's um, st still it's st still hard to penetrate that as healthcare tends to be uh, slow to adopt these newer technologies okay um and i'll, I'll in, in the line of questioning thank you Jonathan. i didn't mean to put you on the spot on, on some of this no worries um i i just wanted to mention for the rest of the um working group there uh there is a the rest of the sig um <clears throat> There is something that we're brewing here at the Linux Foundation. We're not public with yet, but um, I, it's I, it, it touches on the credentialing, perhaps as a mid to long term thing. But the earlier kind of uh, uh, reason for it is is uh, um, contact tracing and exposure notification. Um, there's just this uh, looming disaster we see. Perhaps others are seeing in in the apps that are being released by the public health authorities um, uh, for for contact tracing. And anyway, I mean disaster. It mean I mean somewhat you know, a lack of trust amongst the population in these apps. And a lot of them are, you know, even if they say decentralized or are trying to, to put things kind of behind the scenes that would kind of compromise uh, whatever those promises might be of privacy and confidentiality, that sort of thing. So um, I, putting together a public health initiative kind of focused on, on those apps, but also on helping scale the tooling that public health authorities would use for contact tracing. Um, don't want to say much more, not much more to say, uh, but there are some partners aligning around that and, and looking at a, a launch um, in the next three weeks or so. Uh, that's all flexible. If anyone is is spending a lot of their time on contact tracing now um, uh, or is connected to organizations that are, I, I think we're coming up with a really good model to scale this out. So um, uh, please follow up with me privately and uh, I'm happy to, to share more. And I would be also be remiss if I didn't mention the trust over IP stack, uh, so which is uh, coming out of the, the as a joint development yes. project from the the I, uh, Linux Foundation. I think that is where the the synergy of the decentralized identifiers, verifiable credentials, as well as the policy and trust frameworks, the governance frameworks, actually build into the organizational infrastructure that actually allows this technology to meet governance. 
Yeah, and in particular with that, uh, uh, if, if, uh, if identity is something that people are really interested in around this stuff, uh, there's a white paper that the foundation has published. It's kind of the introduction to the concept, and there's kind of four layers of governance. The topmost layer of which is how do you pull together the you know parties to agree on issuing credentials and verifying those credentials at a semantic level at a you know here's the the clinics here's the doctors here's the places where you prove those credentials are valid um, and that happens at a level entirely different from the utility network th things like sovereign or um, uh, you know other other kind of uh, uh, even the Ethereum network uh, right that can be used as your key management store and then there's a couple intervene you know layers in between that <laughs> um, but it tries to put this kind of conceptual model together and then what we see coming out of that is it serves as a skeleton for new governance organizations at those different layers and so this is where I was asking about CCI and if there's other groups that we might want to be connected with to potentially be a governance organization at those those upper layers of the toy stack. Yeah, Jonathan, I thought you made a great point earlier when you talked about um, the example you gave of, you know, somebody getting uh, uh, a vaccination in Germany, flying to the U.S. kind of a thing. What that, that use case hits is the concept to me of sustainable trust. Um, it's not at the transaction level. It's, I'll call it the long-term trusted relationships of all those different parties, which very much is a healthcare problem. Um, in the healthcare network. And that's where that whole trust over IP idea with the different governance layers. And you made the point that rather than rush into the, what I call technical solution, the right idea is let's get governance right and understand what that should be for the use case first. And then from there, you can easily say, okay, this is the way we need to build out and architect the actual solution. But getting, I'll call it a long-term governance model that's gonna be sustainable uh, to keep, I'll call it the trust, um, and improve it, if you will, over time in the network is maybe the biggest challenge of all. Yeah, and often time that's not something we talk about in the working groups is that we talk about the technology and we get these things to validate. But the, the real question is, why would I trust this certificate? But what's the, what's the chain of trust? And, and I think that in a decentralized solution is, is hard to wrap our minds around. Uh, and because we, we have this idea of this pillar of this hierarchy of a certificate authority of, I, I trust it because it's issued by this organization. But it's really gonna be difficult to see how, let's say your your driver's license is like the government is gonna issue a, a driver's license anytime soon under a cryptographic verifiable credential. And I think it really would be like a distributed trust model at, at first and and really my, I, I, I'm a verifier and I know the issuer um, and but how do we extend that across borders? And I think it's great. This is going to be a topic. Um, I'll be uh, on this panel uh, at the UN in September talking about the merger of technology, healthcare, and governance. And this is exactly the, my point was we, we need to mer merge all those, those three in order for it to be successful. Yeah. And so tied to governance really is what I call behind that in a sense, that trust model um, is really what I call the authority. Where is the authority coming from? The source of authority for that trust. And in some cases, it's declarative, like I'm you know, the state governor of Rhode Island, so I can declare whatever I want because I'm the legal entity here. But in other cases, it's reputational as well. So depending upon, well, especially a healthcare network, there's a combination of different types of authority that would be the source of trust for governance for sure. Yeah, and it really would be this idea of trust but verify and or the combination of decentralized solutions and yet there's an anchor of trust in like this trust over ip uh, yes. governance model yeah, yeah. absolutely well uh so we are coming up to the top of the hour uh thanks everyone uh so uh just as a reminder uh our next meeting is in two weeks same time same place so thanks for that uh excellent conversation today thanks very much for your participation and uh, looking forward to, to uh, catching up with any, everyone in, in two weeks. Uh, Ravish, I'll, I'll loop back around with you uh, with an email so we can get you scheduled uh, for the payer subgroup. That said, uh, everyone have a great day, have a great weekend, and please stay safe. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.